You know, I'm pretty sure there's something called caller ID that they could have used to figure out if it was a prank, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, where were we? Bexy turned white. Oh, we've been pranked. I said on the phone, what station is this? Uh, wait, we read this. Blah, blah, blah. I handed Bexy her cell phone. I'm sorry, I have to let you go, Bexy said, near tears, already imagining the heat coming down from headquarters. Thank you. That's when the murder hit the fan. Right away, the phone started ringing. One of the first calls was Schmidt at the force of his screaming blew my hair back. How can anyone be so stupid? Why would the president of France call a vice presidential candidate a few days out? The question, I thought. Weren't you the ones that set this up? Uh, no, they didn't. That's, that is a legitimate question, though, Palin. Why would the president of France call you? As Schmidt's rant, Schmidt's, rant, yeah, Schmidt's rant blazed on, I pictured cell phone towers between D.C. and Florida bursting into flame. I held the phone tightly away from my head. That's when I got another call. Governor, I am so sorry, a campaign advisor said. I put the call on the schedule. I thought it was vetted. I was fooled. I'm so sorry. I felt bad for him because he was absolutely stellar professional, so I knew these radio guys had to be good to get around him. We later found out that there's some DJs pranked a lot of leaders and celebrities including Bono, Mick Jagger, Donald Trump, and Bill Gates. So we were in good company. This explanation was so heartfelt. Don't worry about it. You don't need to apologize, I said. It really is no big deal. You just need to dust off and move on. That's when we reached Lakeland. Tucker bounded aboard the bus. This is terrible, terrible. I need to know everything you said on that phone call. I said, Tucker, I already told Bexie and Jason what I said. Now, why don't we focus on how to fix this problem? Well, this is just terrible. R2-D2, where are you? He said, with his face flushed red. With the higher-up still foaming at a headquarters, the B-team had swung into action. Jason called a friend who worked for the Canadian Prime Minister within five minutes and had a transcript of the call. Then Tracy Schmidt, then Tracy Schmidt wrote a terrific statement which already hit the press by the time Lakeland Rally began. Governor Palin was mildly amused to learn that she joined the ranks of the heads of service, including President Sarkozy and other celebrities as being targeted by these pranksters. Tracy wrote, C'est la vie. So this whole segment was entirely pointless. As the campaign drew to a close, oh my god, finally we're getting to the end. My family and I were still pumped. We were having the time of our lives, even though we were just complaining just a few minutes ago. And we ramped up our efforts to make clear vote to voters the distinctions between the McCain administration and Obama administration, working to win a few more votes. And the final day before the election, John and I crisscrossed the nation separately in order to hit as many states as physically possible. John touched down in Florida, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, Indiana, New Mexico, Nevada, and Arizona. The VP team moved from east to west, also chasing the sun, and hit seven rallies in Ohio, Missouri, Iowa, Colorado, and Nevada. Our families provided incredible support that day, speaking all over the nation at campaign events in key states. On November 3rd, we joined Chuck and Sally and Chuck Jr. and Jim and Fahey, again, it's called a comma palin, for a late evening event in a high school gym in Elko, Nevada, and flew right through through the night to Alaska to cast our votes. Todd and all our parents were there. In my opinion, some of the campaign's best advocates for John McCain's message. It was perfect that we got to wrap it all up together in a high school gym, just like the one we had been joined together in when high school... Yeah, just like the one we had been joined together in when Todd and I met 27 years earlier. We began the journey when we landed in Arizona for vetting on a pitch black night. Now in the early hours of November 4th, we landed in Anchorage in darkness, too. A fleet of surveyor suburbans whisked us 50 miles from the airport in Wasilla. When Todd and I arrived in City Hall, we were overjoyed to see crowds of friends and supporters standing in the frigid Arctic darkness, cheering me on, uh, cheering on one of their own. I was so humbled and so excited to see everyone after we were weeks away from home. It felt good to be home. After a round of handshakes and hugs, I stepped into City Hall. It was a full circle moment. A place where Todd and I cast ballots for president and vice president of the United States was where I had attended the second grade and later all those city meetings. I was even wearing the same wardrobe I had often worn back then. Jeans, a Carhartt jacket, and a relief smile. Oh god, no shirts. Come on. Yeah, I know. I'm just nitpicking there. 
and marveled at life's providential paths. Or you may call such events coincidences, but I believe they are miracles. Despite the previous all-nighter and the pundit's swan song for a ticket, I felt great. I felt thankful. After voting, we jogged across the street to the well up line of partisan demarcation to greet some dear friends and a large gathering of international reporters. Well, this is good. I thought our tiny town is making news all across the world. Jason took a couple of phone calls, and I saw him shaking his head. Someone from headquarters was calling to tell the B team, Put her back in the truck! The instruction was not to allow me or Todd to talk to the reporters who had traveled all the way to Wasilla. Smart idea. <coughs> nah, not this time, I thought, and walked over to finally say hello. Afterward, we were scooted back to the trucks and began the police escort motorcade back to Anchorage. After a quick run-in through a couple of coffee stands, we stopped at my brother-in-law's gas station for a few snacks. It seemed fitting that after some hundred-plus interviews across hundred-plus cities, plus 130 campaign events, some of them glitzy, our last-second record campaign stop was an ordinary family business. As we boarded the campaign plane bound for Phoenix, I was confident but prepared to accept America's decision. Chris and I talked about the possibility of miracles. We honestly believed it could happen. We would not be surprised if voters entered the booth and pulled the lever for the GOP despite what I, the polls said. No matter what happened, though, I knew personally I was much better off depending on God's plan, not my own. It's easy to forget that in the chaos of a national election, but when life invariably leads me back to that truth, my perspective changes and I find myself at peace amongst all. Um, I find peace amidst all storms. Stepping back onto the plane, I silently acknowledge my human weaknesses. There's a lot of those. Consciously hand my future over to God and ask for his wisdom, grace, and strength. Chapter 17 of Chapter 4. How much more is there of this? Oh, my God. oh not much. Sweet. In the week leading up to the election, Matt Scully and I, along with a quiet, quiet level-headed speechwriter named Lindsay Hayes, worked on a speech I would give on election night. The national media had already given the McCain campaign last rites, but the B team refused to give up. By election day, Matthew, Lindsay, and I had two speeches in our back pockets, one for victory and one for concession. I wanted to make sure that in either case, the speech focused on two things, reminding America of what kind of man John McCain is, and what he promised to do for the country, and moving forward, uni uniting with the new administration, while still holding accountable for where we disagreed. <laughs> yeah, I doubt you would do that either way. By the way, stop glorifying McCain. This is your memoir, not his. Kind of a kiss-ass, if you ask me. Let's see. We were committed to this, to stand strong for America. Either way, I want to focus on giving a shout-out to John and to our nation to tell them thank you for an honor of a lifetime for my family and me. We're proud to be Americans. I wanted to say a word, finally, in appreciation of the Bush-Cheney administration's efforts. Last I checked, Cheney wasn't invited because it would hurt the campaign. That's just from what I remember. I was so happy to have my family and friends in Arizona with me. Todd's parents had flown all the way from Dillingham. Mom and Dad had my siblings and their families again with the frickin' Just use a comma! You can be like, Mom, Dad, my siblings, and their families all came in. Not Mom and Dad and my siblings and their families. Todd's siblings and step-siblings, Martin Busser was the Iditarod musher, had flown down with his wife. Todd's Iron Dog partner, Scott Davis, his wife made the trip. Make Stapleton, Chris and her family, some of the kids' friends, they were all from these different little towns across Alaska where you drive for hours or fly in a puddle jumper just to get to Anchorage, so then you can leave that state. After that, it's a four-hour trip just to get to the lower 48, then another flight to get down there to Arizona. I'm glad they had endured the journey to be together on this amazing day, especially since I hardly had time to... Especially since I hardly had time to give anyone the time of day since August 29th. I hardly had time to give anyone the time of day? Whatever. I promise to make it up to anyone, everyone, and someday I will. During the crush of the campaign, family and friends unfortunately didn't always come first. I 
effect that nagged me the whole time. Now I look forward to being able to finally, no matter what, take a deep breath and enjoy the last part of this ride together, no matter how it turned out. And we'd be enjoying it in this beautiful, warm desert city, instead of Sub-Zero Land, where even daylight was scarce this time of the year. The Biltmore Resort was more like a complex than a traditional hotel. That meant the rooms for everyone were spread out among the different buildings, with candidates and staff and family flung all over the place. In our room, Todd and the kids and I were. With Chris and Meg, as the election return rolled in from east to west and flashed across the screen, we prayed for a miracle. But finally, the moment came when it was very clear for us that we were not going to win. It was very, very disappointing. Yes, it had been a great contest in the historic election, and I still believe we had the stronger, smarter agenda for the country. It was unfortunate that our message didn't seem to take hold. As Vince Lombardi said, winning every isn't everything, but wanting to win is. Yes, we wanted to win very much for America. In any case, I knew that Matthew and Lindsay had done the campaign proud. It was time to step aside, but at least I was going to have this last moment to acknowledge my debt to John and thank him for giving me and my family, and Alaska, yes, she puts, and Alaska, in all, with an exclamation point, not all caps, or separate, whatever. This is an incredible experience. I wanted to tell Americans to keep fighting for what is right, and not to let anyone tell them to sit down and shut up, even though you really need to do that. As we got ready for concession speeches, I noticed a lot of Blackberry traffic, even more than usual. It was then that Jason said, This is unbelievable. Sounds like you're not going to be giving the speech after all. Other staffers' mouths fell wide open. Someone bugged her out in the room. Governor, they want you over at Senator McCain's suite. I carried the speech to John's suite, wondering why headquarters had have all of this time had us spend all this time drafting a speech if I wasn't going to deliver it. Why? Because you screwed up the campaign so much. John's suite was packed with campaign staff when we walked in. A senior staffer said, You know you won't be giving a speech, he said. It's a powerful message, I told him. Scully did a great job. It's a shout out to McCain and her reminds the country that he's an American hero. This is all about unity and bringing the country together now. Then Schmidt waited in. You're not giving one because it's never been done in the history of presidential politics. The vice presidential candidate does not give a concession speech. I knew he was so wrong about that, but I wasn't going to argue with him. Okay, if he's so wrong about it, would you like to give an example? No? Didn't think so. But then again, I could be wrong. Um, someone might have done it. I don't know. I don't really care either. I'm just glad that we're finally getting to the end of this damn thing. <sighs> Let's see. So... I wasn't going to argue with him, so I just said, Steve, a lot of things have never been done before. John hadn't earned his reputation for independent thinking by doing things the way that had always been done, and neither had I. Don't think of it as a concession speech, I said. Think of it as a way of honoring the man we've been working for for all these months. Absolutely not, Schmidt said. I don't even know why you wrote a speech. Nobody told you to. That set me on the back of my heels. I was surprised that he was surprised. <laughs> What? I didn't find out until after the campaign where the idea of the concession, concession speech had originated. It came from the most natural source, Matthew Scully. About a week out from the election day, he realized I had been a bit more visible than some vice presidential candidates. There was a good possibility I might be asked to speak on election night. John Edwards had spoken in 2004. Yeah, maybe she did give an example, but I'm not sure. And one of Scully's responsibilities as a speechwriter was to be proactive, to make sure that the candidate was never caught without something to say, even though you were caught several times with that. Uh, even though you were caught several times without anything to say. Wow, it's really bad when I've been reading this for so long and I can't even make my jabs at her right.